reading edition of Literacy Corner. This is book television and I am so excited, I believe you are, because you want to know what it is that we have to offer as far as book television is concerned. Today, I am privileged to meet a guest, a wonderful professor, a lecturer, a teacher, a father, everything that you can think of, a researcher. And um, if you have um, heard about or read some of the books, for example, I have in my hand here Blood, which is a play. He's written a lot of plays. He's done tremendous things, and I've read equally uh, read some of his books. And so I'm here to introduce one. First of all, Professor Victor Yanka had his secondary education at Tamale, a school in Tamale, and then went on to further his studies at the University of Cape Coast. Um, he also studied with the University of Sheffield in the UK, uh, and then continued his education at the University of Ghana. He holds a PhD in African Studies. He is also a winner of ScriptNet 2000 and then a screenwriting competition in the UK which was held and had a screenplay filmed for Channel 4 TV in the UK. He is also a fellow of the African Humanities Program of the American Council of Learned Societies. Um, we'll be looking at some of his plays, probably even he will give us some of his poems, you know, and everything that there is. I introduce to you on Literacy Corner, Professor Victor Yanka. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you so much. You know, I'm very excited. I've been worrying you to have to meet you, and I thank God so much for making it possible for us to meet. Um, what is it that inspired you to write all of these books? The poems, the plays, the scripts, everything. What really inspired you to go into that? Um, well, some of these things are things that maybe they come to you naturally in life. Um, as a child growing up in secondary school, one of the things I liked to do was reading, reading stories. And in fact, even before secondary school, my stepmother used to tell us stories. Let me tell you how it all started. My stepmother was someone who made kinky. And so every evening, anytime she's wrapping, you know, she would make the kinky into balls. The gang kinky. Yeah, the gang kinky. And then wrap them in the leaves. And this way back in the Upper West region. So anytime she was making the kinky, she made us help her. And to encourage us to come around and help her, she would be telling us folk tales. So as we're doing the KK, she'll be telling us folk tales. And so my creative impulses started from there. That instinct came from there. So when I went to secondary school, I was reading a lot. And, um, and in the sixth, no, it was in form five, I wrote some poems which were published in our school magazine. I, I didn't even, even though they would be published, two of them. And then I, wrote a play at the A-level. But let me tell you another interesting part. I was also in the school drama society, yeah, okay. which we call Cultural Brigade in Ghana Secondary School at that time. And the school dramatic society was always interested in performing different plays. Well, please, which year? What, what? Oh, okay. I'm talking about from the form one to form five, I'm talking about 1972 to 1977. Wow, I wasn't born. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you have been an idea in your parents' mind yet. And then, uh, sixth form was from 78, 78 to 79. Well, started 77 into 79. Now, so in the holidays, that's after my A level, we formed a drama society in Wa, and we used to perform at the cultural center, in fact, we call the community center in Wa at that time. Every weekend, we took folk tales, the local folk tales, and we dramatized them. Yeah. And people came, children, in fact, mostly it was children, came and listened. So we're trying to bring our folk tales to life uh, in dramatic form before our, our children. So that, that the, all those things, of course, had that in all that it is no surprise me. that you yeah. turn out to be a professor of theater. Well, well, well. <laughs> okay. mm, anyway, so. so what is your work schedule like? Because I know you do a lot of things, writing, combining with lecturing, 
mm -hmm. all of that? What is your work schedule? Like, how do you combine? It? Well, um, the lecturing. Actually, let me tell you something. And I, I know many people will take will not believe this, but every man who is married is a full-time husband and part-time worker. Really? <laughs> if you are at work and your wife calls you and says, oh, this is happening this way, can you go there and solve this for me? You may leave the work you are doing to go and do that. So which is important, your work or that one? <laughs> I see. Anyway, but that's, that's on the lighter okay. note. <laughs> yeah, but yes, I um, wake up in the morning, I have to get myself ready. Uh, well, I sleep late because I mostly work in the night. Um, get ready, come to work, have my lectures and um, meetings and then also running around to do a few things. Then the time I do my writing is when I go home and in the night because then I can say, I may, people, some people get tired but that is when my creative impulse comes, just before I sleep, I write something, a little bit of something. So that's the way it is for me. So would you say that as a child you always knew that you wanted to become a professor of theatre? Write plays, people, enact them, you know. So how much have you learned the folklore from your grandparents and my, your, my, my stepmother. Your step, wow. Mm, stepmother, you hear that? Mm -hmm. So you learnt a lot. Some of us, we don't learn anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so please tell us, we are interested. As a child growing up, to be honest with you, I wanted to be a news reader. Oh, okay. And um, I used to love to see people on the screen reading, reading news when we had a black and white TV. Mm. Um, and also to hear their voices on, the, on air. My favorite was Here is the News, read by John Hammond. Oh, okay. I don't think you remember him. Then we later we had Vida, Koranteng, Ashanti, and all of them. So, uh, yeah, so I used to, and we only had GBC actually. Okay. Mm. So I wanted to be a newsreader. And so I got into the arts. Actually, I was good in the agri and the and also in the arts. But I finally found myself in the arts, and I thought that would lead me to that. But at the time of entering the university, the courses I was offered were not in that direction. So I found myself where I am now. Mm -hmm. wow. So what does your family really think about your writings? You know? mm, my family? A lot of I, I suppose my family just take it as a given that, oh, my dad is writing. He's, never, he's a writer. Mm -hmm. And um, when I write my plays, they want to come and see, they come and see the plays and they, they comment and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't make much of a difference to them. It's not like they are so excited. Yeah. Uh, there was one I won the ScriptNet Award uh, in 2000 that I saw that enthusiasm, that, mm -hmm. that excitement in them. Yeah. No, but they just take it as a given, oh, he's a writer, and that's it. Wow. <laughs> so with that award in the UK, that was in America. That was here, here. Actually, they came here and they organized it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so how many? But it was organized by the UK. Mm -hmm. How many plays do you have to your credits? Books you have co-authored and all of that. Who talk about my professional ones. publications? Let me start with the publications. Well, as a professor, I may have published around 24, 25 articles wow. in journals and. Uh, books and so on. Okay. Um, though some of them, including here, is one of them, which is uh, between language and literature. You know, my first degree was in English literature, and so I here yeah, is here, and there are some in other journals around. I have around. this one yeah, here. This, black is, this is a creative work. Okay. Um, so those ones are there. Then, as for books for institutions like textbooks. I have written for Cambridge, yes. uh, Cambridge University Press, and I think um, here is one that we published uh, English for senior high schools. I think this book is now being used by secondary schools in Ghana. Okay. Um, if you go to Ivy Saddle, if you go to any other schools here, you find it. But they have changed it. They've taken the Cambridge away. And it's Black Star series. Oh, okay. But our names are there as the writers. Wow. So written from book one to book 
four, in fact it was book four, but now we've revised it to book one, to book three for the new syllabus that came out. And then I've also written for the distance learning program. I have written quite a number of them with some of these in communicative skills, in African literature, some of which you can see here, and so many of them. I think I've written about between seven and eight of their models that they are using for the African Studies program now. And bits of writing here and there, I, I really can't count. So that is so true because I have personally, you know, read that and I will not stop talking about it because of the impact it had on my, my, my GPA then. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I want to ask for upcoming writers mm -hmm. like myself, because I really love to write and definitely the first time I launched my book, I know you were there to witness it, to support me and all of that. So what advice, what suggestions can you give for an upcoming writer like myself and any other person who may be watching? You want to write? Why the hell are you sitting at home <laughs> and not taking your pen and writing? But on a lighter note, let me say that for a writer, it's a, I mean, writing is a craft. It's a skill uh, and it's a craft you learn. And so you may have that talent in you, but you need to develop it. And that is where the skill aspect comes in. Right. So there are people there who say they are writers, they just take the pen and write. But somehow they need to develop a skill. For instance, if you have to do anything creative, you want to write a play, you want to write a novel. Even music. Music. Of course, first of all, you need that inspiration. We call it the muse, the writer's muse. Okay. Now, if the muse is there, the next thing is the craft. How are you going to do the writing? What are you doing? How are you going about it all? And of course, with every piece of writing, you need to keep your audience engaged. Whoever you are writing for, think about how you can keep them engaged in whatever you are writing. If at any point you disengage them, they feel bored, they'll throw your book away, put it somewhere, another shelf, say, go. It's just one of those rules. If it's a play, in playwriting, for instance, we say you must have conflict. Conflict is the soul of drama. It's what will keep your audience watching your play all the way to the end. Even novels, conflict has to be there. So think about those. How do you keep your audience engaged? That's important. And don't ever do it just like one of them, a one of them. Keep going at it. Whatever you're writing, you must consistent and persistent, persist in whatever you are doing, then you can achieve results. Mm -hmm. If you do it as a one-off, and the next time you um, try my hand at it again, you will not get results. Wow. So if I can recall exactly what you've said as an incoming writer, you should first of all think of your craft, have a skill, you learn it, you nurture it, you are persistent, and then you also become creative. You said you should have a problem with the audience, having yeah, you have the engaged them, audience, you engage the mm -hmm. audience. Wow. In that case, how what makes a good story? Because I know that you say just have a beginning, a middle, and end, and you have a story. So you've mentioned conflict. That is, I'm asking this follow-up question. So what makes a good story? How can I write, you know, to get to the audience? Whether it is a prose I'm writing, whether it's a fiction and fiction, be it prose, if it is a drama, if it is even poetry. Because <coughs> before we close to I want you to really give us some of your poems you know, just to enjoy that. So what yeah. makes a good story? What makes a good story? A good story Aside is a good story. Yes. A good story is a good story. It's not what makes a good story. You can have a good story, but if you don't tell your story well, you have no story. You've not communicated. So what makes a good story well told? Oh, okay. Right? So you have a good story. In the telling of it, your story can peter out and your audience will not enjoy whatever you are saying if you haven't written it well. So a good story, of course, as I said earlier, is one that will really engage your audience. And to engage your audience, you as a writer, you don't write the ordinary, what everybody knows. Let's see a difference in whatever you will write. That is talking about the craft. You can describe this laptop and everybody will know it's a laptop. But you can describe it in another way using language that audience will say, wow, 
I've never thought about it like that. That way, your audience will be like, wow, I want to continue reading this and see what more this person has to say. By creating the suspense. Of course, suspense and all of those. And so that is the skill, the craft. You have to bring it in. So conflict, yes, even drama, in drama and even in prose, conflict is there. And in some poems, you have conflict. Right. So that is the soul of it all. And when you have told the story well, you have to bring your audience back down and let them resolution. feel there is some kind of, as you said, resolution. But at that moment, you will realize that you have come back to some stable position and your audience are satisfied. When you have told a story and your audience feel like, wow, I enjoyed that. That's a good story. You, you, you watch some movies, mm. you, you do certain things, or you observe something, you realize that you are not satisfied. You would have loved for the movie to have ended in this way and all of that. So in that case, do you think they have not written any good scripts? Or no, they have. Or they have. It depends. It depends on what the writer wants to do. Achieve. Right. Yeah, what he wants to achieve. Um, is it sometimes we watch a movie, you watch a play, and the writer is like, how do I keep my audience thinking at the end of this? Because he's not only interested in satisfying you, yes, you've enjoyed the work, but at the end he wants you to think about things. I have written a play, The Pretty Trees of Gakwana. Mm. Now, that play was performed in the University of Cape Coast here, and it's an environmental play. Now, at the end of that play, what I did was to let the audience decide how the play should end. So, somebody asked, so what should, the, what should Anansi do? Because I've created the situation, the audience, on the first day, the audience chose one, one, one choice, and when they choose a choice, when they pick a cho make a choice, there is an ending in the play that will satisfy that choice they made. If they pick the other one, the second day they took a different ending and we use the other ending. So it's like that. You want to play with your audience and let them really get into it. Talking after the performance is over. So that is what I did. Well, thank you. <laughs> I believe you are learning a lot, just like myself, because I can't wait to know how he gives us the follow-up, you know. Answers. But then, um, you've written a lot of books. So how long, I mean, approximately, does it take to write a book? Uh, the first time I wrote my book, like, uh, after my service, I, I think I took barely two months to write. And I, I also mentioned along the line that uh, you wrote, you love to write your books in the night, you know, when there's calm, there's <coughs> and all that. So, I want to know how long does it take, or how long should it take a good writer to write or finish one book? No time. <laughs> no time limit. You see, the thing about writing is um, sometimes, in fact, there was a, there's a I, I, was it Plato or Aristotle who said that when you have finished writing, put it down for a number of years, then go back and pick it yes. and read it. I've written a play and four or five years later I've had to revise the play. So it can take you one year, it can take you months, it can take you days, depending on one, how you write. Are you the prolific type? Do you write very quickly and want to get your story off with and you think it's okay? If you are prolific and you are very good, you can write a play and get or a dry a novel and get it out of the off your desk very quickly. Or you can be the I don't know what, what to say, but the kind of ponderous writer who wants to think about everything that he's writing. I wrote this. Let me put it down for a while. Follow what I just said. And after a while, you take it again and then do it. So in that case, it can take a year, two, or more. So there are several dimensions to this, right? So there's no hard and fast rule about how long it should take for you to finish writing. It's like making a movie. Some movies are made in years. And some are made in a shorter time. But that's how it is. Once you can tell your story and tell it well within the time you want to use or the time you can use. You know, these days, uh, I want to digress a little bit. Like, 
textbooks that we have for students. Maybe you are contracted and you are given a particular time frame to finish the books. These are going to be books that the kids will use even for generations and all of that. And then you don't do your research properly, you know, you just know that you have to finish for the money and all of that. So that is why I asked the question. Oh, those ones are determined by the money, as you just said. And so the people have given you a contract. For instance, the Cambridge book that we wrote, it was, um, were contracted to do it. Now, they gave us a time frame, but the interesting thing is that they also came down and sat down with us as we worked, and we worked in teams. So it's like, when you have a contract like that, you want to do a thorough job, because you are doing it for the money. I write, I'm not writing for the money. So I can take my time and do whatever I'm doing. But if you are doing it for the money, of course, then pressure will be on you. And once the pressure is on you, it's over to you to decide how you want to do this. Do you want to hire people to help you? Because you want to do it within a certain time frame. And so those people uh, will have a share in whatever you get anyway. But you will have done a good job. But if you don't hire people to help, and when you hire the people to help, you must supervise them anyway. And then, at the end of it, you all satisfy those people, or your, contra your contractors or whoever. So that is the way to go with that one. But for us who are into creative writing and into other things, we take our time to write what we so want to do. So it boils down to passion. You get passionate about Of course, the passion is there. It's one of the determining factors, yes. So how do you get ideas, you know, to write your plays and all of that? Because, as well, you know, for lack of creativity, people tend to go on the internet to just copy, you know, sometimes adaptations and they don't do the right kind of adaptation and all of that. So how do you get the ideas? You know? mm. Let me give you an example to illustrate this, or maybe a couple of them. You know the book you just mentioned, Dear Blood? Yes. It was... One of the books I studied, it was uh, Oedipus's, uh, what do you call it, uh, what do you call it? Sophocles' Antigone. Antigone. Now, Antigone, we studied it in the class in my second year in the university. I'm talking about 1982, 1983. Yeah. And after the lecture, I went to my, after one of the lectures, I went to my, my lecturer, he was then, master student well so it was a research assistant something like that i said do you know that i see some element of feminism in this play and he disagreed with me i said no but there's an element of women's empowerment in it empowerment in it and we argued we did we debated it and i said okay you know what this play i'm going to rework it and then bring out where those women elements and that was the motivation to write that play way back. But after a while, I just put it aside as I've just told you. And sometimes it's the occasions, it's events that determine what I should write. Experiences uh, come in. Or reading, like Dear Blood, it's my reading. I read this play and I think I want to do something about it. That's how you get your ideas. Or in a discussion, something can come up. Even newspapers, you read a paper, something comes up. You say, wow, I think this is a good idea. I can use it for a story. A lot of ideas are, we say ideas are all around you. If you're a writer, they are all around you. You, it's like a stimulus, uh, what do you call it, response kind of thing. I, the whole environment is your stimulus. You as a writer, you respond to that stimulus. So that is it, ideas are all around you. Because back... Uh, way back in the university, you know, you are taught that uh, most writers are influenced by their experiences mm -hmm. and the things that they go through. Mm -hmm. So, unless, of course, a writer explicitly states that I'm writing an autobiography, yeah. otherwise, you know that definitely be something that is around the person that is what makes the person tend to write what yeah, you so want them so. to write. So, with that, at least you've told us that your experiences, the stimulus, your environment, all of these things guided you to write some of these things. So uh, the question I want to ask is, um, when did you write your first book? And how old were you? I remember mine. <laughs> yeah. My first book, 
But the first thing I wrote was a poem. Okay. Uh, in secondary school, if I told you that our school magazine, I wrote two poems that were published in my school you magazine. You still have those poems? No. I, I'm somebody recently got a cut a, a picture of the school magazine with my picture on, in it because I was a member of the editorial board. Can you give us a line in your couplet? You want to hear? I remember it. One of them was about a woman, about African woman, black woman. I want her black, ebony black, not white or a tag, always in the slag. I want her white. Wow, in you're happy though. A faithful <laughs> and economic woman. My black jewel, convivial and puerile, not cantan cross and found for. Mm. That kind of thing. So it was, well, it's those wonderful. were the times I was in school. So. <laughs> So that was the point. Then the first play was in my A-level days. It was called Snake in the Boot. Uh, if you find a snake in your boot, square in your boot, you don't know, you put your foot in it. Is it published? No, it got lost. Mm -hmm. I wrote it and when I came to university, in fact I had it in manuscript form. In those days, publication, forget it. You know, typing like this was not easy. So it was in manuscript form. And then um, I came here and St. Peter's Seminary, the uh, major seminary here, some students came and said they wanted to perform it. Well, photocopy opportunities were not there. So I came in the script, go and do it and bring it back to me. And they went and lost it. So I've lost that book. So that was when I wrote my first play. Yeah, and it was good. It was Snake in the Boot, simply had to do with tribalism. Is the stake in the boot of society. So, and then some other issues came up with uh, Sikaman, was the next one that came to mind, and it was when the 1983 there was this famine where there was so much hunger and whatnot, and people were eating all kinds of things. So, there are some lines in the play that have that, and so that's what you know, motivated me to write that play, and so on and so on. So, that's the way it has gone. You know, one wow. after another. So how many published and unpublished? Three you of the articles and yeah, for articles they are all published. Okay. My, my, they are published in journals and whatnot. But if they are not published, those are the things that they use to promote you as a university, as an academic. And then these books for the, the College of Distance Education, of course, they are published, and these other ones. But talking about the creative works, I think none of my poems have been published. But I'll read one or two to you anyway. Oh, then, um, but Dear Blood is the one, and Dear Blood is currently being used by training colleges mm. in Ghana. Some training colleges in Ghana. It's, it's a play that they are studying, and the university students here have been studying in the English department. They also study it. So, um, but the. Others, I think the Razor's Edge was the first published one. The Razor's Edge and Strangers, they are one at place. They were the first published ones, and they were published by Ghana Publishing Corporation. Right. So those were the ones. I'm just excited because it sounded like music when you were even reciting the mm -hmm. poems and all of that. Would you say that you are, you are successful as a literary professor? <laughs> so how would you define a successful, you know, Writer, would you say that you, you've been successful at your work? Success is relative, you know. Um, I'm not really, uh, I will not say I'm very successful. I will say I'm making the efforts that I can make to at least help people come up, to help the younger ones come up. But I actually I won't call myself a successful writer. Yet. No, I am, oh, the I'm, a, I'm, no, I'm trying, I'm striving to be a writer. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, I wouldn't say I'm successful, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to do something that will change society, you know, at least, yeah. Especially for the environment, for the political situation. I, some of my plays have to do with the political situation. Yes. Yeah, and so if you take the uh, demon crazy, it's, uh, it's a comedy and it's, it's satirical. Mm -hmm. So that's how it is.
Um, so you would not, you said it's been excellent, so you are not going to define what's excellent. But I'm Men really surprised because I know you have done so well, you are doing very well for this department, the professor of theatre, and I believe you have learned a lot. How do you, if you are a new writer, upcoming writer, you write poems and all of that, you know, you can put them together, anthology of poems, you put them together, you write them, you've been taught how to write. Your environment can influence you, your friends can influence you, even your own experiences in life can fashion the way you write and you put them into writing. You also have to take your time, learn the skill, get people, mentors, like Professor himself here, yeah, Professor Victoria. But thank you so much for this time. And I'm really, really glad. He, we are not going to, until you have read your poems. Yes, please. So you have the platform. For... One of them I wrote in my first year in university when we visited the car. Actually, see that they are in transparencies because I read them in the US and there they use overhead projectors. So they'll put this on the overhead projector and project it as I did the reading. So um, I want to read from them. This one is called The Spectre. And The Spectre is about the castle, um, Elmina Castle, Cape Coast Castle. So that's where, uh, when I wrote it. It was an experience uh, as we got into the castle. And there were these white, uh, well, African Americans who had arrived and then we were all going through the castle. So, after that, I wrote this poem. It's called The Spectre. Here we go. There stands today a rocky, moldy monument, denting the green patch and dwarfing the ancient town as it has done since days once upon a time. Once upon a time, from this rock of rooms, from this monument of our blood, the blood of your grand one and mine, millions have squeezed through needle-eye gates with clanging, complaining feet. They were packed skin tight and from across the vast stretch re-echoed to us nobody knows the trouble i see nobody knows my sorrow nobody knows the trouble i see glory hallelujah they gave us the wine and then the guns and we celebrated our doom we laid our block we erected our scaffold and set our noose. Ask from Kumasi, they will tell you. Go to Elmina, it was the same. See, see how your great aunt was chained, to li chained like a cow for the slaughter. Come into this dungeon and feel the chill that pain their souls to anguish greater far than hell with the song of the splashing waves to lull them to haunted dreams. Swing low. Sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Welcome home, sister. Welcome. The resistance spirit that survived the airless condemned cells. Welcome home, sister. Welcome. Listen to the bears, they bid you. Welcome. Hear the drums, they bid you welcome. Home is where the spirit finds an ending peace. Welcome back home. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I believe you've taken something out of this. This has been the Tracy Corner, only on book television. And I'm your host, Dr. Spearmine Thank you. And catch you sometime.